Hello everyone, Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for showing up this week. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. So what do we talk about? Well, way back in, what was it, November, I was wondering if it was a new bull leg and then market slowed down a little bit and everybody got all excited and predicted the top and predict early and often, as I say, right? And then... Um, Turned out it wasn't the end of the world, and we'll look at that when we get to the charts. Your questions on trading, which I will see a few of those uh, coming in. How does one answer if he, she has no sound? <laughs> well, sometimes a squirrel gets his nuts caught uh, in the in the wires between me and you. Lots of things have to happen, so um, it might be as simple as your speakers are not on. So, turn on your speakers, Sam. <laughs> Anyway, uh, your favorite stock picks. Wait until we get to the charts, and if you don't mind, ask about one stock at a time. Just ask about a stock, hit return, punch the ticker in, and hit return. That's for your benefit to make sure we cover them all. More on IPOs. Boy, I'm kind of glad we're following up on this because uh, it's kind of interesting. Following the methodology follow-up. I'm going to continue to talk about this, and, boy, we got some great examples lately. Not not profitable examples. Um so much, but just uh, painful examples of why it is hard. And this isn't the, necessarily the main focus this week, but I guess it's more of the, the hardest, easiest thing you've ever done. WTSHF2. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, as I often say. All predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, right, let's. we were talking about this snap crap thing for quite a while. In fact, since day one and I thought it'd be kind of fun and I'll just go through this real quickly because I've talked about it extensively but I thought it'd be kind of cool and as I've said before a lot of my research comes from trying to prove things in a simple way but I thought it'd be kind of cool to say okay I need some sort of system that won't allow me to buy during the first week of trading combined with uh, an entry etc and what I came up with was like, okay, well, let's just, if the stock is at a new closing high and the first day of trading was not the first, was not the highest level in the first week. In other words, this bar here was not the highest in the first week. And it's above the five-day moving average, and that would keep you from buying within a few days. Now, I do have... A pattern that will get you long on day five in the IPO course. This was just something I wanted to put out there. And the moving average keeps you out for the first five days. Because look, one, two, three, four, five. And then it's not until day six that the moving average begins to kick in. And the system was just simply saying, okay, the low has to be above the moving average. And it has to be a new closing high. And if the high was set on the first day of trading. The all-time high was set on the first day of trading, like if it looked like this. It not only would have to close at a new high, let's say the close was here, it would also have to close above that high, and that's it. And let's see what happened with Snapcrap. Well, so far, Snapcrap has headed lower. And I know I often say, don't confuse the issue with facts, but I fail to understand how a company that lets you put googly eyes, all it does is let you put googly eyes on and puke a rainbow, how that sending out to your and send them out to your friends can make sense for business. But hey, stranger things have happened. I've bought some stocks, I've done stranger things and going straight up, but then I'll later understand them. It's like um let's take Facebook for in, for instance. I really didn't understand Facebook, but now I get it. They have an incredible income stream coming from advertising. And it's the hottest thing in hot time now. Now as I said before the simplest thing you can do in an IPO, and that's this little system I just developed here on the fly to illustrate a point. And a lot of stuff I do on the fly to illustrate a point, actually, I end up incorporating to my own trading and actually ends up working. And that's kind of the fun thing about being a public figure and publishing things and putting it all out there as I learn in the process. But uh, Will Rogers once said, getting back to the IPOs, if they don't go up, don't buy them. Now, he was talking about stocks in general, and he was being a little bit facetious. But... That got me to thinking a few years back, like, what if you just bought IPOs that went up? And as a general statement, that's a pretty good idea. But don't buy them if they go down. So give them at least a week, see what they do. And then you can see this simple little system would have kept you out 
of this Snapchat debacle, which happened overnight. So if they don't go up, don't buy them. I think that uh, makes a lot of sense. I don't know if this, I would probably shouldn't follow up each week now this thing has died, uh, but you get the idea. Maybe we'll take this, we won't uh, talk about this next week. Now, I want to continue my discussion on why following methodology is the hardest thing to do. It's, when things are going swimmingly, that really doesn't define you. And I do a lot of reading on motivation and human performance and the brain and all these different things. And it seems like, and I've got quote, um, not just quote monitors, but books on quotes uh, littering my desk with a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> and it seems like most of the quotes or, or many of the quotes deal with adversity and setbacks and, and so on and so forth. And that's what trading is all about. It, it's being able to survive the occasional adversities. Now, Let's just follow up on what we've been talking about for a while here. Back in February, the open portfolio was on the cusp of going negative. And you can see here it was at barely in the plus column. And that's if without this one swing trade in here that was taking profits on, that profits were taken on, I should say, it actually would be negative. My point was let's just continue to follow along and see what happens. Now, luckily in this case, it actually worked out. And you can go back to February. You can see that's where we were. And then as of last night, this is where we are now. Now, this isn't the open portfolio. Uh, I do have an example in upcoming slides where I'm going to show you the open portfolio. But the point is not to track the portfolio, as I would say, a week after week. The point is to just see it, each position to its fruition. And in this case, you see this one is highlighted here. That's the only thing that's left open is a half a position. And the Snapchat, and that, I'm sorry, the Snapchat, Freudian slip, Kim, K-E-M. And that's the profit as of last night on that. So had you given up then, you would have not captured this particular stock. So it's very important to follow along, not only when things are going well, but especially when things are looking a little questionable. So we'll say bye, Felicia. For now, and I'm going to continue to follow this portfolio until the chem eventually snaps out. <laughs> so let's continue our uh, construct. Uh, Me rewind that. Let's continue our discussion on more on why trim trends following is so small. So this week's episode is insanity defined question mark plus when the SHTF number two is question mark. Now, I'll show you why. I'm not trying to be, make a pun, but it's kind of funny that it actually worked out that way. So the question is, did the SHTF hit the fan two times in as many weeks? Well, yeah, I guess. Depends on how you look at it. But my point is that in this particular case, we were long a stock and we come in and it opened it actually opened above our stop it had bad earnings and we'll talk about the news here in just one second and then it took the stop out now if you were applying a little discretion and the reason i posted in the service page that i said if it takes out the opening range you need a bail for those who are using a little discretion sometimes you get a fast move on the open okay and it doesn't necessarily have to start with a big gap like this and you can survive that by giving it a little bit of time, but you have to have an uncle point in mind. So if that opening range does get established fairly quickly, then you put in a stop below the opening range. And the, the idea is the incremental loss here can sometimes help you to survive a position or at the least can help you get out at a better price. Now, you are in get out of the position mode. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this in just one second. We talked a lot about it last week, so I'm going to try to get through as quickly as possible. But you're in get out position mode, so but you're trying to mitigate the damage that has occurred. Now, the point I'm trying to make this week with this one is, and, and I don't want to sugarcoat it. It sucks. Years ago, people would get mad at me because they, don't, they didn't seem like I was... You don't seem like you're mad enough when something stops out. It's like, well, you're not sitting in my office and hearing me scream F-bombs. I scream 
I had an F bomb this morning on a forex deal that went horribly wrong. I had two positions that just uh, two independent positions that should have worked opposite of each other, and they both went the wrong way. And my, I didn't realize my door was open. Good thing I live in the middle of nowhere. Otherwise, I think I would have woken a neighbor. I had such a big F bomb. So yeah, I am still human. I still have a pulse. I still get upset about things, but I've been working on it for the last 20 something years to not get as upset as I used to and not get the press and just deal with it and look at things for what they are. Number one, shit happens. Okay. And like I said last week, sometimes twice. Okay. And lo and behold, it happened twice. But you have to look at whether it's a catastrophe, which will happen, one of the few things that I can guarantee, or if it's just the cost of doing business. Now, on every trade, we're going to risk 2% as part of the methodology. So the portfolio I follow mechanically, okay, and that's to avoid any confusion because if I start using discretion of the portfolio, then a lot of people are going to get very confused very quickly. And they're also going to point to hindsight or whatever, fudging. So rather, I like to keep the portfolio mechanical just so everybody can follow along. Now, as I said a second ago, if you're risking 2% of trade, that'll turn into what, 2K per 100K. And if you look here, you could see on a mechanical basis if it stopped out because it stopped was actually trailed a little bit higher it came out to a 1.6 percent loss yes it sucks but it's all part of the or it's all in the line of doing business you will have some loss so it's more of a cost of doing business type of trade versus a debacle now I was talking with one of you guys yesterday, and we agreed, and, and I, I really dig you clients that get it, you know, <laughs> I, I have to say, and you know, there's going to be ups and those will be downs. Usually, if somebody's been with me several years, they finally get it, because they've had those really good trades, and they also had a few stinkers come along. And one thing that I've done a lot of, obviously, is a lot of momentum type of trading and I've also done a lot of research there and I've also done a lot of relative strength research which in some ways you can kind of use those two terms interchangeably but relative strength you're measuring the strength of one market against another and then for a while I was actually running the Landry 100 I, I wasn't actually putting dollars to it but it was more like a mechanical type of was mechanical it was I was picking the stock still but I was using, I could only put a stock in if it was making a new high, ideally on an on expansion of range. And I would keep 100 stocks in the portfolio at all times. Now, what I'm saying was it wasn't, I was putting the stocks in at the close every day and taking them out at the close every day But I, for the stinkers. But I wasn't actually trading 100 stocks. I just wanted to see if some sort of pure relative strength type, type of model would work and through the process I discovered and rediscovered a lot of things but it just was more work for me on a daily basis it was too much to keep up with but there were times when over a period of time it was beating the S&P by a factor of about three times but in the process I noticed that it often ended badly in other words that momentum would just get slammed really really hard and, and as I said earlier I was talking to one of you guys yesterday and sometimes these momentum stocks can be a source of funds if the, if the market swings to a defensive mode real quick. Uh, let me rewind that. Sometimes it can be a source of funds when some uh, areas are beginning to rise from the ashes. Let's say some value stocks that are quote unquote at value levels or low levels, however you want to look at it, begin to rally. These momentum stocks get sold. Uh, if the market gets a little skittish, these high beta, so-called high beta stocks, or high momentum, have you want to look at them, they get sold off quickly. So a lot of times it ends badly, and that's just trend trading in general for that matter. And so it's, I relearn these things. And where I'm going with this is Mike Moody was talking to the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts 
one time, and he was doing a lot of uh, or showing a lot of his research that he worked for, uh, I want to say Dorsey and Wright. I don't know if they have that right, no pun intended. Uh, he worked for some firm for years, and I think he went out on his own. But in those years, he did a lot, a lot of work on relative strain. So I raised my hand, and I was like, um, you know, Mike's kind of low-key. I was like, hey, Mike, um, question. I have yet to solve for the fact that relative strength slash momentum trading ends badly. And if I ever could, you would never see my fat ass again. And he's real low-key and just kind of smiled a little bit. And he thought for a second. He says, well, Dave, if you're going to have a baby, you know, babies are nice. They're fun. They're cool. You want to have a baby sometimes? Yeah, it's, it's an awesome thing, right? But you're going to have a lot of baby poop. And that's the way he describes a relative strength type of trading. It comes with the territory. So it's something that you just have to brace, embrace, and Except now I want to go through a little bit of this damage control real quick because we covered it in detail last week and we've covered it time and time again. But I think it's important every time a situation comes up to, to rehash upon it because sooner or later it will happen again. Now, the thing, the point I want to make is just take your lumps if you don't have the discipline. Don't be like the proverbial guy who gets caught like the deer in the headlights, the proverbial deer in the headlights. So as we said last week, again, and as I showed you briefly what the fuel trade is, let's say your stop is here and it gaps below, then you want to have an uncle point in mind. Now in the fuel trade, it actually opened above the stop and it made a fast move lower. It was also a gap too. So on that fast move, you have to decide at what point are you going to get out. So you do have to have a little bit of a plan going in. Say, okay, well, let me just see how it opens up. And you can't wait one minute. You can't wait 10 minutes. You just have to sit there for a little while, and that little while depends, and decide whether or not you're going to get out. Now, if it starts blowing through that uncle point, you have to get out. So you will lose more when it doesn't work, but a lot of times you will have that really crappy opening and then the market turns around. The reason that happens, as I said last week, is you're, you want to sell your stock, and this guy, the market maker, is forced to buy the stock from you. He has got to feed his family, okay? And he doesn't want to be left holding the bag. A lot of, uh, a lot of crappy sophomoric metaphors this week, huh? Uh, he doesn't want to be left holding the bag. So he's going to say, oh, you want to sell it to me? You know, supply and demand. That's how things work. Everybody's rushing to the floor door at the same time. He's going to open it at, at as low as price as he can, knowing that there's a pretty good chance that it's such a distressed value that he can bring it up enough to flip out of that trade. So if he's going to buy 10,000 shares and he drops it down to, let's say, let's say stock's at 20, he drops the stock to 10, well, he knows he could probably get out a couple of points higher at some point during the day when the panic subsides. So he could flip it out. Every 10,000 shares he flips out makes $20,000 at 12 bucks a share. Now, he's getting paid to do a job, but you know what? He's also taking a lot of risk, too, because sometimes it might gap lower and keep on going. He doesn't know what comes behind that 10,000 shares he just ate in the next 10,000 shares he just ate. There might be another 100,000 shares looming in the distance. Somebody might be getting margin called, okay? Somebody might get more being getting ugh, somebody might be getting margin called on other positions. Some hedge fund might be in the process of blowing up a little bit and it becomes a fire sale. So he's doing his job too. You can't hate the guy, all right? Now the question is do you hold or do you not hold after the catastrophe, okay? So this is where it becomes difficult. Let's say you didn't get out at an approved exit, but it didn't take out the opening range, and then now you're looking at the close of the first day of the disaster. You, get, you got through the morning disaster, the afternoon disaster. Do you keep holding? Well, it takes a lot of discipline to do that because 
you're 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 no longer in longer term trend following mode if you're trend following something like this, okay, and then all of a sudden it's down here. Okay. So what you're looking to do is improve your exit either intraday or you have to make that hold or no hold decision. Now, if something gaps like this and then by the end of the day it's way back up here, then it's a no-brainer, you're still in trend following mode. But as I said last week, if you want to keep holding that, you have to be careful because one, now you've increased your number of decisions, and I've done plenty of presentations on what happens when that occurs. And then number two, you could end up in a state of regret. If tomorrow that stock continues to implode, because as I said last week, which I think is the next one coming up, cockroach theory. Cockroach theory is that you see one cockroach. There's not just that one cockroach. There's plenty more in the walls, right, or somewhere. So is there like another shoe to drop, so to speak? And then the other problem is the longer you start holding it, the more possession theory comes into works. The more you begin to, uh, what's the word, prattle? Is that a word? You, the more you begin to prattle that loss. And, and that's been proven in a variety of ways, that the, the longer you have something, the more attached you become to it. So the problem that often occurs with, with trading is that we're just not made to trade. As humans, and I think I'm getting a little further ahead of myself, but we are wired to avoid pain. And you have to embrace the fact that we're simply not made to trade. And I'm going to get to that in just one second, some more details. And the same things, as I often say, that are keeping you alive and well and functioning as a human being, both on a physiological level and a psychological level, can often get in the way of your trading. So you have to learn from the past, but you can't be crippled by it. And this might be a good time to see what Jill wrote here. Dave, it's painful to watch the winners turn into losers. Okay. Well, before we go any further, I think the whole portfolio thing of me going back to that February portfolio or doing it in real time was the fact that someone sent me an email that said the same thing. We had had a few losing trades and they wanted to bail out on everything else. And I'm not exactly sure if it's if that's how this got started. The reason I'm not exactly sure is that it's a reoccurring theme. We're wired to avoid play, pain and obviously seek pleasure too. The opposite of that. Okay, let's see. It's painful to watch winners turn to losers. I was taught not to let this happen. No. See, that's the problem. That's conventional wisdom. Okay? And as I'm going to get into in one minute and beat the dead horse in this, imagine that, me beating a dead horse, repeating myself. The only way you're going to make money is to capture a trend. And in the end, the trend ends badly. And it wasn't the greatest book of trading ever written because there's some things in there that I, I wouldn't recommend you do, like trading the, the turtle breakout type of system. But I will say that Curtis Facebook, The Way of the Turtle, was interesting in, in that it provided a lot of insight into trend following. And one of the things that, that Curtis Faith said was that Dennis treated losses to, to open gains differently than he did to outright losses. So if someone had a position and they let profits erode, okay, quote unquote, let profits erode, he understood that that was part of the process. Now, if someone had a position is just losing, 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 then he was, he was a lot more different. He treated that a lot more differently. So this comes back to the Mike Moody argument about the baby poop, okay? If you're going to trade a momentum, occasionally it will end badly. In all trades, eventually end badly, some worse than others. Okay, what else did she say? Uh, I was taught to not to let this happen. Well, see, that's wrong because you're never going to catch a trend unless you're willing to let it go against you a little bit. You know, tight stops seem to be universally preached. Well, guess what? If your stop is too tight, 
you'll never catch a trend. It's become increasingly difficult not to pull the plug prematurely before the stop. As such, we should get into something. As such, we should get something for our efforts. Sing. Um, no, well, that's why we take partial profits. Okay, and that's the psychology. Let's just take a, let's take a step back. A uh, good question. Good question. Yeah, I'm getting a, I get a lot of those type of questions anytime something goes wrong. And you know, my goal is to try to keep it real, and 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 that's why I, you know, yesterday I'm not going to say his name, but it, I should have screen captured it. I I saw a tweet from someone. How to turn a thousand dollars into a million dollars really fast or quickly or something like that? I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, you, know, you can't make this up. It's like I, I I'm doing this this course as you guys know, and I, I put some stuff into the uh, into the copy that were direct quotes from things that I received. Like make two to four percent every day and stuff like that, and I can't believe it's like every time I put something in the copy, I see something that's even more absurd. Okay, if you can turn a thousand dollars into a million dollars quickly, then I say go do it. Okay, rinse and repeat, but you can't. So anyway, where was I? I digress. Imagine that. All right. Well, let's say you get into a trade, and as a general statement, we trade pullbacks. So you get up a little pullback, and the reason we take partial profits is because, well, when we go into the trade, let's start with, uh, uh, let's start with unknown number one. Unknown number one is whether or not the stock will rally in the first place. So we got to put a stop in, okay? Unknown number two is whether or not the longer term trend will resume. Now we've got a nice little pattern coming in, nice little thrust higher or nice trend higher, whatever you want to look at that. A little bit of a pullback or a TKO or some type of move. And we're looking to get in right as that trend begins to resume. And the hope, and I know I said hope, but the hope is that trend is going to go up for a long, long time. But there's two unknowns. First, we don't know if it's going to go up short, shorter term. And second, we don't know if it's going to go up longer term. So you take partial profits and barring overnight gaps, which we've been talking about a lot lately, right? Your stop comes to break even and barring overnight gaps, the worst you can do is scratch on a trade. That's what I call the better the poke the eye trade. And if things work out, you end up following along for a long, long time. Now, I have some slides I'm going to show about how that works. And it's very tough not to let the past affect your trading. And as I often say, if anyone in here has millennial children and you get angry at them over something that was seemingly meaningless, right? And an outsider might think, this guy is a, I can't say it, but, you know, <laughs> he's a, an a-hole, right? But it's not that one little thing they did. It's everything they did leading up for that. And it's not just millennials. Your spouse sometimes might set you off. It, it, it's some little pet peeve you might have or something or something they did. And it's not necessarily that one little action, but it's all the actions that led up to that. As I told a client once before, it was a bit of an epiphany for him. And I'm like, look, the reason you're having so much trouble taking a small loss on a trade is it's not that loss in and of itself. It's the loss of every other trade you have ever had. It's the pain. You're bringing that pain back in. You're feeling that pain. And this line of reasoning is not original to me, although I feel it quite often, especially when it happens quite a bit. I mean, I got whacked out of one on Forex yesterday. I'm going to get whacked out of one today. So it's kind of like, as you'll see in a second, that's a definition of insanity. Why am I doing the same thing over and over again? Well, because I'm following the system. But the line of reasoning about the storms of the past affecting your future, or losses of the past at least affecting your future, 
that I, I give that to uh, the late great Mark Douglas on that discipline trader. I think is probably where he talked about that or whatever his second book was. One of those books, Trading in the Zone or something. I'd recommend you read them. And I keep threatening to reread them. I'm going to have to reread them again. But you can't let that affect your next trade. You can't become frozen on your next trade, even if that next trade just doesn't work out. Now, I'm going to come back. My slides are a little mixed up because I didn't get them, I didn't get them organized and organized properly in time. I didn't have time to revert, rehearse. But the one thing to remember is you're you're going to the only way to capture a profit is to capture a trend. And the real money is in the longer term trend following. And there's going to have a lot of new you're going to have a lot of news events along the way. So before we get into all that, I just want to say read my lips. I ignore all news. Now, as soon as I say that, I bet you a thousand dollars I get an email tonight. Hey D, this is gonna happen, or the Fed's gonna meet, or they have earnings coming up. What do I do? Well, don't do anything because like death, taxes, and I guess now kale, you can't avoid it, okay? Now, in the course that uh, the first few videos of the course, and one of them I addressed the news thing that I just uh, put out, and, and you can get started on that for free, so I'll, I'll show you that towards the end of the show. But somebody asked me, he's like, wait a bit, Dave, you were a little confusing on that. You, I thought you said news doesn't affect markets, but obviously it does. And my point is that it does affect the markets, but there's nothing you could do about it. And often it's illogical, okay? The market might have a muted reaction to some really bad news or some really good news. Well, that's probably because it's already baked into the cake. If it has a bad reaction to good news, then that means that that good news was already factored in, and they were looking for, pardon my English, even gooder news, you know? So let's say they were looking for, it's like, oh, this company's going to make 100% earnings, and they make 95% earnings. Well, they still made 95% growth over quarter over quarter earnings. That's good, right? No, we were looking for 100%, so the stock gets creamed, okay? So very, very, very hard to connect the dots with the news. And if you watch the video, uh, you can see that I took a line, took a took a page out of Greg Morris's uh, book, speaking book, speaking uh, lectures or whatever, where he shows a chart with a lot of news events, and he challenges you to pick them out. Now, in his case, he was using a stock, and he was challenging you to pick out the earnings periods and challenging you even further to say if you could pick them out, whether the earnings were good or bad. And one thing that I learned early on in my trading career, it's usually not what you know that kills you. You come in and all of a sudden you get blindsided with something that there's no way in the world you could have ever seen coming. Now, obvious, an obvious example is something like 9-11, but it happens on a much more micro level, okay? A CEO decides to uh, sexually harass his secretary, you know? It's like WTF, you know, something just out of the blue like that, and a stock gets decimated, okay? A product fails miserably. The list goes on and on. Something out of the blue happens, and it's usually not what you know that kills you. It's what you don't know, and guess what? There's nothing you can do about what you don't know. Now, as a general statement, and you're probably going to find this very hard to believe, surprises tend to happen in the direction of the trend. It's like I was telling my people last night. It's like the difference between a depression and a recession is if, you, if your neighbor loses his job, that's a recession. If you lose your job, it's a depression, okay? So it's kind of hard when you're getting beat up to still see things clearly. But as a general statement, surprises tend to happen in the direction of the trend. So if you're trend following, and I guess here's that word, hope, you're just going to have to hope for the best and deal with it and know that longer term, surprises will happen in the direction of the trend.
which brings us to our next point. And I wrote about this a while back in a column that was inspired by Greg Morris. And his point is the absolute worst time to create or change a rule is when you're mostly concerned about something that seems to not be working correctly. And he was relating to his, his fighter pilot days and, sim, and simulators and all. And I'm sure the line of reasoning goes along the line of all the pilots who have been killed by not trusting their, their instruments. And you can't change rules midstream while you're emotional about something. Like Jill just said, you know what, I just want to bail on everything. Well, you know, maybe we need to take a snapshot of today's portfolio and and make that our new portfolio to see what happens. Okay? That might bore you to death. But it would be kind of interesting to see whether following a plan was a thing to do. And it might not be, but longer term, it's the thing to do. And I know it's hard. We're simply just not made to trade. As I alluded to earlier or said earlier, I should say, we're wired to avoid pain. Otherwise, we'd all be dead. The kids, kids don't necessarily recognize the danger of things. I have a friend of mine's wife's son. He'll get like on the top of the truck, their truck. They've got a big truck to pull the big camper thing they have and He'll get like way up in the air, and, and you know he went to jump off the other day. And she, luckily, she was outside. She caught him. He did. He just doesn't know better. He has no fear. He has no pain avoidance. But had he jumped off and broken a leg, then he'd realize I shouldn't do that anymore. And if you don't learn from what's happening to you, or at least learn from other people's experience then you're not going to live very long on this earth. So deep down, we're wired to avoid pain. The problem is by trying to avoid pain, you end up missing the next opportunities. Okay, it all comes back to following the plan, even though sometimes it's pretty hard to follow the darn plan. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different outcome. So I'm going to hold through earnings. Bam, I got creamed. Wow, I'm going to hold through earnings. Bam, I got creamed. So you're thinking, all right, F this, I will never hold through earnings. And guess what? The next trade turns into the mother of all trades. And as I often preach, the outlier is key. Go back and look at that portfolio. I think, yeah, it's it's. you could go back a few slides after the show's done, rewind it, and notice that, $5,000 worth of whatever the open profits are. I think they're even less than $5, much less than $5, or that one outlier trade. Now, I don't want to make it sound too elusive. And as I've said before, I've been criticized at doing that. It's like I don't want to come out here and say, oh, it's impossible. It's not impossible. It's just not always easy to keep plodding along. But you have to keep plodding along because you're, ne you're never going to catch that outlier. And, you know, by the way, I don't want to digress too far. I know it's too late right but like Greg said the worst thing you can do is change the rule the worst thing you can do now after you get whacked a little bit is to go out and search for a new system something other than trend following well first of all I think my trend following is about as pure as you could get when it comes to trend following so any other trend following model is going to look a lot like mine but if you give it up on trend following, then you're faced with some other possible problems. It, what I'm saying is all methodologies are going to have their problems. Now, as I said a second ago, getting back to the outliers, your big money is in the longer term trends. And you have to occasionally capture a nice big trend. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to pay for the loser. So the real money is in the longer term trend. And during those longer term trends, guess what's going to happen? There's going to be some news events that occur. If you look at a few of the big winners and more recent times, in this case, CNX, we had how many periods? Let's count them up at least. And then we're, it was another month or two before it even stopped out. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, almost a year 
in this trade? Well, how many quarters in a year? Four quarters in a year, right? So that's four earning periods. In this case, it probably only was about three. Or there's four Fed meetings. Or in this case, I think it was an, it's an energy stock. So how many OPEC meetings were there? You know? So you just have to stick with things. And here's the Kemet, which is in the open portfolio. I took the snapshot uh, right before the open. And you could see that, okay, the buy was way back here. So, so far, we've got half a month. And then there's like one, two, three, and a half a month, okay? So what is that, four months? So it's now been four months. Well, I don't know when. And you guys, let's see if we can pick it out. Maybe it was this day here. I don't know. But somewhere in this period, if somebody wants to look it up, that'd be great. Somewhere during this four months, there was an earning period, okay? And let's say it was right here, and, and you got out on this day here. Well, guess what? You're sucking wind because you missed a 50% gain from that point forward, okay? And the old commodity adage, and I know mine's in the gutter this week, but you can't eat like a bird and defecate like an elephant. You can't take little gains because it feels comfortable. Like Jill's saying, well, I want those gains, okay? I have mentally monetized those gains. I need that money. I want that money. Well, first of all, you shouldn't need the money if it's in a trading account, okay? Not that you want to throw caution to the wind, but you need to think of that money as money you're going to trade. That is at-risk money. And hopefully, and there's that word again, but hopefully if you do things right, you're able to grow that money longer term. Now, last week we talked about the potential for black swan. So if you do think you're going to go off and chase some rainbows, whatever you do, just make sure you have limited losses, the potential for limited losses, and a limited gains and not just the opposite. And as I often preach to a point of ad nauseum is... Don't walk away, but run from so-called income-producing methods. I would love a method where I could push a button and get a peanut, okay? And guess what? There are methods out there to do that. And then they work until they don't, as I often say, okay? So if you want to develop a trading system that's very accurate, you want to risk this much and then make this much. Or even better, have unlimited risk, okay? And take little tiny profits. And guess what? You're going to be 95% accurate, maybe even more. Well, that 5% will kill you. Okay? So it provided you survive two things. One, mentally. Well, first, first and foremost, provided you survive monetarily. You know, that's a, weird, that's a weird feeling. And I was part of some things that ended really badly. That's kind of where we get to those two drink minimum things. And I don't want to go on record on. But I was part of some stuff that ended really badly. And it's one thing to plot along, plot along, plot along, plot along, and then have everything really in badly. And it's another thing to plot along, plot along, have a little setback, plot along, plot along, plot along, have a little setback. I can live with that. But from a psychological standpoint, it is really tough. Trust me on this. It is really tough to get creamed to a point where you're mentally and monetarily shaken, okay, or stirred, I should say, you, to where you, it's, it's hard to come back from that. You can come back from the occasional spanking, right? Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, start all over again. But if you get creamed on something in a really bad way, it's going to be really tough, really tough to come back from it. So you have to have your head wrapped around the wrist and then the old ugly black swan shows its head. All right. Let's see something. Um, yeah, keep the questions coming. I'll see if I can work them in. Uh, again, the only way to really make money is through longer-term trend following. Now, that's very dangerous in and of itself. That's why you read about all these famous traders who made all this money but if you do a quick Google, you'll find that a lot of them have subsequently blown up. So my only solution for that dangerous longer-term trend following is start off with a low risk 
and then use a hybrid model for money and position management. Like I was saying earlier to Jill, you take those partial profits just in case a longer term trend doesn't materialize. And guess what? Now you have half the risk on. So even if something bad happens, really bad happens, at least you're only getting hit for half the amount. Now, the problem comes along with something like uh, Twilio trade, which I'm ready to forget about, by the way. So today will be the last day I mentioned it. Remember, forget about those storms of the past. But we had a full position on, okay? So that really sucks. But sometimes once you're in longer term trend following mode, and that's what we're talking about, longer term trend following mode, you've taken those profits off and now you have a half a position on. And the, the beauty is your, your stop is such to where when you do get stopped out, you're only giving up open profits. I know only, but let's say you're up 200% and your stop is going to stop you out at 150% gain and you get stopped out. Well, you know, that sucks that you lost from there to there. It's not like losing 50%. I don't forget what the math is on that. Um, like 25%, okay, of that open trade. But you still made 150%. Well, that's like the hokey pokey. That's what trend following is all about. In the end, it's going to end badly. And if you watch the uh, – I keep coming back to this course because I'm really excited about it. But start watching these videos. And I go into a lot of detail about how things – in badly. So again, you have to have a system that makes a lot more than it loses. You must position yourself for limited losses and unlimited gains and not just the opposite. If the max you can make is a pure swing trade, then you can't hold through news events. Okay. What am I trying to say there? Well, what I'm trying to say is if you are a pure, pure swing trader and just staying in for a few days in every trade, then you might do really well for a while because you look at some of these trades that that, that took off. I think Twilio is a good example. Oh, damn, I said it again. <laughs> kind of feel like the Knights of Neat. It, it, oh, stop saying it. Well, you can't get very far in life without saying it. Anyway, uh, I digress. But in a case like that, it, it took off a little bit. It took off, okay, took off a little bit, and then it imploded, okay? Well, if you're a pure swing trader, guess what? You got out before it imploded, but guess what? You won't always get out before it implodes. And keep in mind that even day traders blow up, can blow up on a stock halt. And the reason to bring that up is because you could only make so much money over a short period of time, but bad things could still happen. And there, there have been people out there with GoFundMe accounts to try to get them bailed out from their day trading debacles. And I'm not being shot on Friday. I'm just showing, I'm just putting it out there. Learn from their mistakes. All right. Okay. Do you wait until the market closes to make a decision or to hold on to exit? Thoughts on the phrase by the humor, by the rumor selling the news? Okay, two things. Um, don't do any news trading, okay? So forget about the buy the rumor or selling the news. That's an old Wall Street adage, and I hear what you're saying, okay? So it's like if the rumor is that the company's going to have blowout earnings, you know, uh, yeah, buy it, and the stock rallies up, and then you bail out on that news event. And that's what happens sometimes, okay, with the debacle on the news event. Let's say this news is good, okay? Let's say it's great. Okay, and then all of a sudden the stock implodes. Well, it was already baked into the cake, like I said earlier. Somebody back here was in the know and knew, okay? And, you know, sometimes that in the know is what makes trend following work because somebody knows something and they start buying. Well, guess what? They're going to leave footprints on the chart. And then you just go along and buy with them like a moron, like a trend following moron, okay? And then other people... Might get sucked in. You want to call it greater fool theory? That's fine. Greater fool theory. People start coming in and, and thinking, okay, well, somebody will buy even higher. And supply and demand. And sometimes that buying can beget buying. And that's what makes trend following work. So, yeah, selling news. So, let's say you're a hedge fund and you accumulated 5 million shares of something. And now you've got a $20 million profit or whatever the case may be. And you know that news is coming out. Well, you could use that liquidity event of that good news. It might initially have a good pop, and you just you just 
put the pedal to the metal and just dump your shares right on while you have that great liquidity. It happens. It does happen. So, yeah, it's an adage, but you have to look at things and say, can I trade off of this? And if your answer is no, you have to toss it out. So you can't trade off of that adage, okay? Do you wait until the market closes to make a decision? Okay. Uh, well, no, because you're not you're not making a good decision. What you're doing is you're saying, okay, I'm long X Y Z or whatever. Knock it off, Donald. And you're long. Everything's going swimmingly, and all of a sudden there's a news event. It's gonna be right here, earnings or whatever. I don't know. Reason I don't know. Reason I don't know is because I avoid the news. The only way I get news is through osmosis. Somebody emails me. Hey, Dave, the news is coming. The earnings are coming out. What should I do? Oh shit! Now I know the nerd. Oh, now I know earnings are coming out. Now I got to worry about that. I wasn't even worried about that. Okay. Now I'm all worried about that. So, what what Donald's saying is, do you bail out here, knowing that news event's going to happen here? No, no. Let it unfold. It might. Take off the next day, it might upload the next day, okay? If you quit every time you get to the 50-yard line, you'll never make a touchdown. And guess what? Again, those outliers are key. All right, let me... I'm really mad. Not really. <laughs> Don't tell me that. It made me nervous. Do you want to wait until the market closes and make a decision or hold on to it? Uh, well, there's three things to do. So James is asking this. Do you, let's say you're in a damage control situation. The stock opens down here. Let's say your stop was here. Stock opens down here. Well, there's three things that you can do. Um, obviously, first thing is your uncle point. Let's say you survived the uncle point. Though. The point is that you survived the uncle point. You what you do is you look to improve upon the trade by getting out at some point as it comes back, okay? So let's just keep the math easy. Let's say it drops 10 points, okay, minus 10, and then it goes up 5. So you improve by 5 points. You could bail out then. If it comes all the way back and starts going higher, like, like gets well above your stop or well above whatever, the... You know, if it makes the mother of all come back, then by all means, hold it. The tricky part is, do you want to hold if it kind of makes a mediocre comeback? And that's what we're talking about earlier. So that's where you have to make that hard decision. A lot of that hard decision comes with your own psyche, okay? I'm willing to take a spanking to try to improve things. So I'm willing to hold for another day or two to see what happens and then always have that uncle point in mind, okay? So that's where you got to make a decision, and that's where, like I said earlier and last week, you can't you can't become attached to the position through possession theory, okay? And then you can't put yourself in a state of making decision after decision. You end up then end up in that binary, you end up in that binary decision tree, okay? So do you hold to the close? It depends, okay? Just just see if you can approve upon the trade, and then say, okay, well, it's looking like it's going to close fairly well in here. I'm going to go ahead and hold on, knowing that I, I could put myself into a serious state of regret. But the bottom line is, as I often preach, you're going to make a decision and do what? Live with it, okay? So if you can't live with holding overnight, even though it came back greatly, then by all means, exit on the close. So that's a decision for you to make. Discretion is tough because it means you're doing things that or that require decisions or require more decisions. If you're super duper disciplined, then you can require a lot of, then you can apply a lot of discretion, okay? So did that answer your question? I know I got a long winded answer. <laughs> what, I could turn a thousand dollars into a million dollars? I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, I would be too, you know. Uh, God, I could give you so many examples. Uh, I, I watched the webinar a while back, and I was about ready to pull my credit card out. It was only nine ninety seven. You know, it was like take ten thousand dollars and then trade my little system here, 
and turn it to $100,000. Then quit your day job. You know, it's like, what? <laughs> and then make, you know, whatever, 500000 on that. And then now you got this big trading stake. And it's like, no, it, it's not that easy. And somebody said, well, if I only have $5,000, well, you could do it with $5,000. I'm like, no, you can't. <laughs> If you can do it with five thousand dollars, then just just take five thousand dollars, turn it to five hundred thousand dollars, rinse and repeat. So what's uh, what's that? A hundred times return. So take that hundred times return and then do it a hundred more times. Now you got what five billion? Five billion? You know, and you can see it grows really fast. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. The only way to make money in the market is to capture a trend, and as we all know, trend following isn't easy. Okay. <laughs> Taking partial profits worked for me on the fuel trade. I made enough on the first half to cover my losses in the second half to manage to cover out with a small profit overall. Okay, yeah, well, what he's saying is that sometimes that happens too. We had a trade a while back. We got whacked on, and it did this. It did. Uh, it went up, and we hit the profit target. It kind of meandered, and there was like a debacle or something, Okay like this the stop was up here whatever but it still stopped out at a profit overall so I don't count this as a debacle any trade I make money on is not a debacle so his point was with the fuel he took part taking partial profits and then he got the debacle or whatever you want to call it stopped out okay but he made money overall now what I was talking with one of you guys about yesterday unfortunately in the fuel trade the initial profit target was here, and it didn't get there, and it didn't even get that close. I mean, it got pretty close, but it didn't get close enough to make it work, okay? Now, as I often talk about discretion, if it gets this close to that partial profit, okay, or I didn't mean to touch it, but almost touching that partial profit, then by all means, go ahead and lock it in. Don't split hairs, because the market doesn't always work in exacts. I lay out a mechanical plan, and if you're not disciplined, then follow the mechanical plan, but if you want to use a little brain power and have a little discipline, then by all means, if it's closing in on that initial profit target, then take initial profits. <laughs> yeah, that's that effect thing. I didn't have time to Google it. I always get that mixed up, effect versus effect. Um, and usually I Google it, and then I didn't uh, – I use Grammarly a lot too, and that usually saves my butt quite often. You got to realize as a Cajun, English is a second language for me. But yeah, effect, okay. I never said I wanted to bail on everything. Oh, okay. I misread your uh, thing. Okay. Kim earnings 2217. Oh, thank you on that, Kim. I appreciate that. Okay, let's take a look at that. Um, all right, we'll, we'll uh, when we hop out to the charts, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. They call it blowing up your account. The problem is some of these things are out of order. Uh, seems friends write puts collect premiums for extended time periods, but then, but then, then, yeah, yeah. You know, I often say this: uh, selling options is a great way to have a very, very brilliant yet brief career. And the amazing thing there, and it, boy, this comes back to the market being a bad teacher is that it can work for a long, long time. And, and and if you think about what's even worse is the people who who sell you on these systems, they can make money for a long, long time. And so what if they blow up a few people? They could just keep selling more systems to more people. And the problem with something like that is, from a psychological standpoint, you got to think about what's going to happen. Let's say you were doing really well with this system. And I don't want to go into a lot of details, but let's say you're making money month after month after month after month, selling puts or whatever, okay? And something catastrophe, some kind of catastrophe happens, or it doesn't even have to be that big of a catastrophe. Uh, it could be a rule, a government rule change. It could be a terrorist attack, I mean, small or big. Earnings, I mean, something crazy could happen. And you blow out your account. Well, Let's say that you got sucked into this system even more and more. Maybe you mortgage your house or got a home equity load or whatever and dump that, okay, into this system because you're making so much money. You got over leveraged. The market taught you to be a bad trader. 
Well, you get wiped out overnight. <laughs> you know, there's going to be a big temptation to put a bullet in your head. Okay, there's a big difference between an f bomb and putting a bullet in your head. Okay, an f bomb you get over. With. You know, sometimes I even laugh at myself when I when I catch my. I try to laugh at myself when I catch myself getting upset. Exercise, okay. You, you wouldn't know by looking at my fat ass, but I actually exercise quite a bit. I'm I'm actually kind of addicted to cardio. I'd rather do weights. I like doing weights, but right now I seem to be addicted to cardio. Um, believe it or not, I know it's hard to believe, and and that has really saved me uh, quite a bit. I don't want to digress too far into that. What's a Twilio? I don't recall a Twilio. Very good, Craig. Very good. Good job. Nice job. Yes. Do not have remorse in your decision. Absolutely. Buyer's remorse, no. Seller's remorse, just move on. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, it's moving on, okay? And it's not easy sometimes to keep following the system. And that's why I put that definition of insanity thing in there. It's kind of like, oh, I got whacked on earnings. Oh, I got whacked on earnings. Well, it happens. But you'll end up in a situation where you'll look smart over the short term. It's, it's just like micromanaging. OK. And if you take small profits every time you have one, you're going to look really smart for a long time until you get hit with a debacle. And then it's going to take you months and maybe even years or you may never recover from that. OK. So that's the hard part is doing the right thing and not doing what feels good and what brings you comfort. So again, we're wired to avoid pain and sink and sink seek cover. Cover. Let me rewind that again. I don't know what's wrong with my mouth today. We're wired to avoid pain and seek comfort. You want comfort, as I've written before, go buy a comforter. Okay. You want a guarantee? Go buy a toaster, you know? And that's what makes trading hard, but you can do it. You just have to do it. Now, I want to take a step back for a second. If you can't do these things because the trades are stressing you out because of the losses and the, and the giving up profits are stressing you out, you're mentally monetizing those gains and then you're stressing out over losses or even stressing out over open losses to profits, then the secret to that is... And, you know, here's the deal, not to digress, here I go. But that's something, that's my big epiphany with this course that I have out now, is that sometimes just coming back to the utmost basics, in this particular case, if all these things are stressing you out, then all you have to do is trade at a smaller size. Trade at a size that's almost meaningless. And then you're able to follow the plan. And then it becomes more of a matter of fact. Oh, that's matter of fact versus freaking out. That flippant thing that I keep trying to, to work on to get that material right on that. And I'm getting closer and closer. But I often say that you have to be flippant in following a system like you just don't care. The example, it just comes back to me where I was following a mechanical system for someone. I showed someone a currency system, and they and they were a good friend of mine, and they asked me if I would trade for them. And I know I've told the story before, so let me just rush through it for those of you who haven't heard it. And I was mechanically following the system. I'd say, oh, got a signal, bam, took the trade. Got the stop, got the signal, blah, 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 bam, we're long. You get a call up. You know the Japanese parliament's meeting tonight? I'm like, Japanese have a parliament? I'm like, okay. Well, what are you going to do? It's like, follow the system. You know, the Japanese are having a meeting on interest rates. What are you going to do? Uh, follow the system. The Fed's meeting tomorrow. Okay. What does that have to do with anything? Well, what are you going to do? <laughs> follow the system. Okay. So you have to... If you can't follow the system, then drop down your position size to a point where you can follow the system. And then as you become successful following the system, then slowly bump up your size. Now, there's a, I did a big, long speech on this. Imagine that, me doing a big, long speech. 
But the point I was making is that you don't go from a quarter percent to a two percent risk. Okay, you don't go to what's that eight times the risk overnight because what will happen is you'll get whacked a couple a two a couple times at two percent, then you're back to a quarter percent. This would take you like 16 trades, 16 good trades or whatever to make back, or a lot of trades, not necessarily 60, but you know, you get the point. You have to slowly increase, maybe go from a quarter percent to a half percent, and stay at a half percent until you're profitable, and then go up from there. All right. <laughs> Craig says, oh, classic Dave Landry. What about the situation in Nigeria? <laughs> I was speaking at Traders Expo many years ago, probably 12 years ago, maybe shoot, maybe 20 years ago. It was a long time ago, and oil stocks were headed lower. And, uh, and I was throwing, yeah, whenever I do a presentation, I like to show open trades and things and, and you know, let the chips fall where they may. You know, the, the SHTF might happen or it might go up forever, hopefully. And I just said, hope, hopefully that Kemet goes up 400%. And next year, this time, we're talking about Kemet still. <sighs> anyway, long story endless. I know, too late. I was showing all these oil stocks that were headed lower and how we were short these oil stocks, a couple of them at least, and how there were open setups and open positions, blah, blah, blah. And one guy blurted out. He didn't even raise his hand. He just blurted out. What about the situation in Nigeria? And he sounded like, I remember, it sounded like Henry Kissinger. I'm like, what about the situation in Nigeria? And I meant it like, who gives a flip? And he starts explaining to me the situation in Nigeria. <laughs> I'm like, oh, settle down, Beavis. <laughs> it's, it's not what I meant. It's like, who cares? And then luckily, or fortunately, by following the system, the oil stocks did head lower in spite of the situation in Nigeria. All right, James, have a good weekend. <laughs> yeah, Sam, that, um, yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> the guy, like, jumped forward in his seat. I'm like, oh, shit, you know, am I, am I, I think I'm, I'm going to do a round kick on this guy. What's going to happen here? You know, this is, this doesn't look good. <laughs> He's pretty big. <laughs> I don't like getting hit, you know. Hey, it's here. Finally. It's taking me two years. I finally got the course out. Okay. And I've been rolling that out. So look for an email if you're not already signed up. Uh, if you are signed up, just or if you're not signed up, go to my website homepage, davelander.com. Uh, and so there it is. And now it's uh, countdown has hit zero. So just click on the home page and then uh, put your email in and you'll get on the list for that. I'm still uh, working on the learning management system. That's going to take a while. The course takes precedent, but precedent, but the um, the course will be part of that. So I guess it's all it's all in one. And by learning management, I mean you get the you get the video and then you have to take the quiz and you have to pass the quiz to move on. And you know it's been a great learning process for me too. It makes me realize how much material is really in the material by putting together quizzes and all. And so far, uh, from the beta testers on that, the response has been uh, phenomenal. So anyway, uh, course is now available. It says soon available. It's now. It's up now. Anyway, all right, let's get to the live charts. Let's, let's take a look at, uh, you guys can start asking about individual, individual stocks if you want now. Uh, let's take a look at that... Um, that came in on February 2nd, see what happened. Okay, February 2nd. Okay, so that was earnings. So we got in, I forget where we got in, but somewhere like around, I don't know, let's say six and a half, okay? So on February 1st or January 31st, Okay, it's going to have earnings tomorrow, so let's get out at 694. So you made a half a point on the trade, if that much, right? Okay. Yeah, it's better than poking now, but guess what? Instead of making a half a point on the trade, you could have made, now it ain't over yet, I know, but you could see you gave up how much? You gave up 100% move. Okay, and trust me, <laughs> if you don't catch an occasional big winner like this, you'll never make any real money in the markets. So yeah, and then I guess if we add three months to that, so so May second would have been the other, the next earnings. So let's see where May second is. 
well, let's see what May 1st is, I should say. Okay, May 1st is right here. So let's say you bailed out on May 1st. Well, let's do the measurement on that up until the live chart today. You gave up a 23.5% move, hopefully. I know it's word, hope, hopefully, and counting. Okay? So if you got on the first, you've got on the first earnings, you missed a hundred percent move. If you got on the second earnings, you missed a twenty, what was it four percent move, round numbers. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate that. Thank you, Dave. Your answer was very helpful, James. All right. Have a good weekend, gonna run. You too, buddy. <laughs> Sam says, you have an alternate career at Voice Impressions. This trading service thing doesn't work out. <laughs> yeah, okay. My wife can do really good impressions. She doesn't want to. She doesn't want to. I have to work to be funny. But she can do impressions. But she, does, she just doesn't want to. It's like, why not? You know? <laughs> All right, let's take a look at these. Um, This market here, as I've been preaching for a long time, when a market is at or near new highs, give it the benefit of the doubt, okay? New highs here, or almost new highs, and then almost new highs here, and then almost new highs, and then new highs, okay? New highs here, you know, a little consolidation, almost new highs. Just keep giving it the benefit of the doubt for now. And as I said a while back, there were some top pickers that have been calling a top for months and months and months. And when we had that little slide, I think it was back here, they were like, you see, I told you. I'm like, oh, jeez. You're killing me. <laughs> Predict early and often. But, yeah, sooner or later it will end badly. Uh, I sure would like to see this, the P's bust out the new highs and not look back. You could argue that, well, it's kind of a double top looking pattern. Well, classical technical analysis is okay, and I do use it but have some sort of system within that. And I wouldn't worry about this double top until it becomes confirmed by, let's say, a bow tie or a first thrust or some sort of setup, okay? Let's take a look at the P's. I'm sorry, the NASDAQ. NASDAQ was just at all-time highs as of yesterday night, as of last night, as of yesterday, I should say, or coming into the day. So far, so good. Um, doesn't take a rocket scientist to draw an arrow on this chart. So far, it's still headed higher. That reminds me, it's one of the things I was going to say is that uh, I actually am working on a video on that where, uh, I wonder if I have it here. I, I literally once received an email from a rocket scientist, and they said, and you'll see it in the video I'm going to put out, and they said, let's see if I can find it. They said, Dave, rocket science is not rocket science. Trading is rocket science. And I said, you know, you're wrong. Or I, I didn't say you're wrong. I said, I said, let's talk about this. And I said, the reason you're struggling is because logic might help to get a rocket off the ground, but it's not always going to help you in trading because markets are often illogical and always emotional. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that the NASDAQ is headed higher and just draw your big blue arrow. Now, two things about trend come to mind. And I've said this a thousand times, and I know I beat the dead horse, but I'm going to say it again. Linda Rasky once said, and I asked her where she got the, the adages, and she said, oh, they're probably just a florism. She didn't even remember saying them, but she did. She said, a market will do what it has to do to cause the most pain to the most amount of people. And then a corollary to that is that a market will do what it has to do. A market will do the obvious, I'm sorry, in the most unobvious manner, Okay. So if you back out, if you back the chart out a little bit or go back a few weeks or months or whatever, the NASDAQ sure looked like it was headed higher, right? Okay. There's your big blue arrow, right? So what does it do? Well, it has, it went sideways a little bit, went on to even make new highs to confirm, hey, look, I'm just going straight up here. And then, bam, it gets absolutely creamed, okay? 
So it was obviously it was headed. It was obvious it was headed higher, and even it even gapped higher. Okay. And then what happens? It comes right back in. Well, that's kind of the whole theory behind the trend knockout pattern is the market is doing the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner, shaking some people out first. And again, that's why trend following can be hard. I guess i got to stop talking about why trend following is hard. But see, there's a bit of a dilemma there. Trend following is hard, but it's the only way you ever make money trading. So what do you do? Well, you follow the trend. You follow along. But Dave, it's too hard. I can't do it. Okay, we'll trade at a smaller size and see if you can do it then. Uh, Russell, bit of a bummer because it keeps getting stuck in this range. The big blue arrow still points higher there, but the intermediate term arrow has been pointing sideways. So I keep an eye on the bottom of this range. I wouldn't get excited about the Russell until it takes out the bottom of its range. Air on the side of the longer term trend for now, at least on that one. All right, let's uh, hop into these. Uh, well, let's take a look at a couple sectors, and then we'll hop into the individual. Uh, stock questions. A couple of areas out there not doing so hot. Energies and metals and mining not doing so hot. So I would avoid those for now. I don't think it's worth shorting them. Why? Well, because of the situation in Nigeria. No, no, just because... Uh, I prefer to short things that are at super high levels and, and not short things that are at relatively low levels. I'd rather short something up here than kind of in a mid-level, okay? Now, if that's all I'm left with to trade, then yeah, sometimes you have to take what you're offered. But as a girl I once dated said, if I had my rathers, if I had my rathers, I'd rather not do it. Um, as you go through the sectors, even some that were kind of wide and loose and dubious like retail, or starting to look pretty good, okay? A little bit of a knockout today in retail. What did I just say? What's the market do? The most obvious thing, go higher, but it's going to have a few unobvious things along the way. Transports have been just kind of, transports look like what I would call a complex head and shoulder top, which is bearish. Dave, why aren't you, why aren't you bearish? Why don't you shorten them? Well, let's give it the benefit of the doubt. Longer term, it still looks like it's in an uptrend, and it might just be consolidating in here. Let's wait for some sort of sign, such as a bow tie or a first thrust down or something, or at the least maybe take it out the bottom of a major range before getting too excited. Now, as you would expect, most sectors, especially technology-related, look like the market itself. So, so far, so good. And the reason I say technology-related is because the NASDAQ is at new highs. Health service is doing pretty good. Quite a few areas doing pretty good. A lot of people have been calling me with some concerns lately about the state of the market. Well, take a look about the state of sectors. If you take a look at the major MIGs, these Morning Star Industry Groups, and this is the, these are, I got an email a couple days ago, like, what am I using? I'm using these Morning Star Industry Groups. Use whatever you want. Just use it consistently, okay? And I look at all 238 of them every day. Now, these are subsets down here. If you put them in symbol order, you'll get the... Like, for instance, here's the banks. That's just one example. Or let's maybe drugs would be a better example. So if you take a look at, like, drugs, there's going to be all these subsets below them, like drug delivery. Okay, that's drugs overall. There's major drugs. There's just miscellaneous. There's drugs generic. That looks a little bit dubious, right? But, eh, okay, longer term. Drug delivery taken off. Biotechnology, you know, a little sideways, but longer term, still in a trend. So I look at all these little subsectors in here, but when things are, when people question whether or not the market is iffy or if the market gets iffy overall, or if I just want confirmation, I'll look at the major MIGs and see what's happening, the major Morningstar entry groups. And if Phil's in here, we'll throw in a 50-day uh, moving average for his, uh, his viewing pleasure. Let's see if we can find it. And that might give you a good uh, point of reference. So let's take a look at this. So I'm going to rush through these, but okay, well above the moving average, longer term uptrend, not too far from new highs. Okay, so let's go through some of these. Automotive looks kind of dubious. Banking looks kind of dubious. Chemicals a little sideways, okay, but right above the 50-day moving average. Hardware looks good. Software looks good. Conglomerates looks pretty good. Just kind of pulling back in here. Look at the daylight. Lows are greater than moving average. Wow, look at consumer durables. Non-durables, a little wide and loose, but in general going higher. Take a look at diversified services, nice daylight, nice new highs, nice 
slope and a moving average. So as you can see, most of these areas, now here comes the metals. There's the semiconductors. Look at that. Looks good. That, not too good. That, okay. It's financials in general above the moving average. Foods, looking pretty good in here. Health services, looking pretty good. Um, you have to be careful. By the way, you have to be careful with this financial services because it's made up of a lot of uh, ETFs, okay? Just FYI on that. Uh, insurance, eh, not looking so great, but eh, sideways, above the 50. Okay, not the end of the world there. Internet, bam, winning. I feel like Tiny Elvis, you know, look at that. Look at, look at that stock. It's, it's headed high. Look at it. Look at leisure, bam, new highs. Manufacturing, look at that. Uh, nice little, uh, nice little, what do you call that? Daylight, just off all-time highs in here. Material construction, a little sideways, long-term still an uptrend. So you could see, go through these major mixes. That one looked a little ugly, but that's media, you know. Fake news, <laughs> you know, fake news is killing media. We, we might short media soon, you know. But for the most part, most of these areas, metals and mi metals, mining, media, and energy aside, they most look, most of them look pretty good. So just go through these ma these uh, major MIGs, and you could do it pretty quick, as you can see, to get a feel for what's going on. And don't get too excited when you see a couple that look like this. But don't get too excited to get whacked on a stock or two. Remember, it's the depression versus the recession thing okay energies on the phoenix list not the short list yeah yeah yeah, yeah. craig said the energies on the phoenix list and i and i uh, hope and there's a word hope but i'd like to see them go down and make some major major lows let's take a look at uso for instance the uh the oil itself the commodity you can see all the commodity is coming down here to bottom out okay and that would be great so let's say if we make these new multi-year lows, is that going to be like decade plus lows in oil? Then um, then we might have something. Yeah, look at that, okay? So that could be a phoenix. In other words, rise from the ashes. Cool. All right. Have a good one. Phil says, thank you for the 50. Uh, RJ wants to know about, uh, sorry I went so long, guys. Uh, MDXG, MDXG. Uh, yeah, it looks fantastic. Uh, nice acceleration and trend. Wait for a pullback. Put that on your uh, watch list for sure. Good job, RJ. Zynga, Z-N-G-A. Uh, not exactly set up just yet, but let's take a look at this. Um, it's okay. Uh, it's going sideways, as you can see, for years and years and years, but that's okay. It's got some bad memories way back here, but that's so far away. Let's not worry about that. Yeah, maybe on a pullback, this thing pulls back a little bit because the breakout's intact. Now, we don't buy the breakout, okay? We're not breakout players. That did work at some point in time. I think the turtles uh, were in the right place at the right time with the breakout system, okay? SSYS for Donald. Yeah, I mean, it's in a trend. It's not set up. But, yeah, it's absolutely trending, okay? Put it on your watch list. Nice, persistent uptrend, accelerating higher. Good job, Donald. Can you get the stocks that make up? Yeah, it's easy. Uh, how do you get the stocks that make up a group? You go here, and then you just, um, or go up here. And you can't see it on your screen, but it says uh, you could jump to the industry. Let's see, change watch list to industry components. So let's go to, like, the semiconductors since they're doing great, okay? So we're going to change the watch list to the industry components. And then let's sort them by volume. Just so we're not looking at the at the ones that aren't meaningful, okay? And then obviously we don't necessarily want to buy the ones up top because it's big thick stocks. But as you go through these, you can see bam, bam, new high, new high, not so good, not so good, new high, new high, new high, new high, new high. So you get a feel for it pretty quick, okay? Not so good, new high, you know. So you get a feel of new high. That's a that's overall. But yeah, you could you could just pop over the watch list and, and I mean there's that's all part of the um, treasure hunting. Is you say, oh, I found this stock that looks pretty good. Let me see if I can find some more in that uh, sector. Yeah, this looks good. You got a lot of great things working for this stock. It is a little overextended, okay? And like I was talking when I think it was Craig yesterday, it could be a source of funds. It's only thing he's a little nervous right now. I know I preach momentum, 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 but uh, I would wait for a serious knockout type of move before getting something like this. But, yeah, put that on your watch list. Absolutely.
Brad also wants to know about SSYS, SSYS. Absolutely. Put that on your watch list for sure. A-X-O-N. A couple of you guys asked about that one. Yeah, it looks okay. Uh, the, 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 it had such a big breakout here, and it kind of went straight up. I would want to see a little bit more knockout move, but I have to, I have to commend you guys. Your stock picking is getting so much better. You're, you're now asking about things that are trending. I got two guys asking about the same stock that's trending. Perfect. Goose. Uh, I think I would leave this one alone. It doesn't have that super duper wide of a range. I would let it make new highs. I mean, if it let, okay, here, I'll tell you what you can do just to keep things simple. Put the, uh, plot the Dave Landry five day patent and moving manage, moving average Dave Landry pattern and put my name on it twice. So nobody takes credit. So it's going to have to close above this high because the first, the high was the first closing high. And then the low will have to be above the moving average. So wait until it does that before you buy it. Same like with, um, if you have the IPO course, then, then feel free to apply something else to it. But I would let it make new highs as a general statement, uh, simply because the range isn't, isn't huge. At least recently it has been huge. When, W-Y-N-N. Yeah, this looks pretty good. I'm not a huge fan of, of a, just a, a one gap and one wide range bar, but I hear you. It's been doing pretty good for a while. It's a little wide and loose. Um, I think it looks okay. You know, maybe pop into the other casinos like we just uh, talked about and see if there's something that looks better. Jim, I'm not answering that one. Oh, that one? Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. I thought somebody was bringing up Twilio. I'm like, stop it. Leave me alone. <laughs> um, this, is, this is a REIT. And I'm not a big fan of REITs because look at the HV, it's only 15, and then it's got a lot of overhead supply. So anybody who bought in this range will be looking to get out a break even. I mean, I hear you, it's gone up, it's pulled back, it's everything Dave Landry says to do. But it's got a mountain of overhead resistance. It's a REIT and check the HV. Not that I would never buy a REIT, but check the HV. HLNE, five day pattern, DL, five day pattern. HLNE, HLNE, E. Yeah, now this is that's this is what I was this is a better example of the range thing I was just trying to explain. It's only got like a two point range, so I would actually let this break out to new highs and then pull back before looking to get long. Uh, if you wanted to trade the moving average system, that's fine. Dave Landry's moving Dave Landry average system. Uh, then you would wait for it to to and that might be your saving grace. Wait for it to to break above the moving average and close at a new high. So yeah, absolutely. But not the best. <laughs> Dave, did you see what happened to Twilio and Fuel and Earnings? Dave's note to self. Lock Sam from future webinars. Ah, I know you're just yanking my chain. John wants to know about CVGI. 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 Yeah, it looks good. Uh, it's not set up at this particular point in time. But uh, by all means, put it on your watch list. Um, Let's back chart out a little bit. Yeah, it's not bad. Uh, put it on a watch list, okay? DDC, bow tie about to break on 18-month base. All right, let's take a look at that for Mr. Phil. DDC, well, you got a big gap, though. You know, I don't like these, What I, I call it a forced bow tie, okay? If you have a huge gap in the chart, it makes it forces the bow tie to make a bow tie. I'd rather something... Like, like take CNX, for example, when it, it bottomed out last year, okay? Notice how it kind of gradually went lower and it finally made it last pro lower. Then it made this textbook bow tie, okay? I would rather that as opposed to this thing just gapping higher and forcing that bow tie in, okay, on such a big gap. Former lander list and service pick, UCTT on a pullback. I'm in trend following. Yeah, good job. Yeah, and you know, again, that's where the money is. Uh, okay, uh, this is this is one from a while back, a blast from the past. It's it's that's where the money is, and, and you capture a couple of these a year, you made a year. Yeah, it's just got to keep chipping away at it.
URGN on a new closing high. URGN. Yeah, now that might work because now, see, now you got a little range in this thing, okay? One, two, three, four, five. And then I think you would actually be long on the on one of the things we do with IPOs. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. So if we add in the five-day moving average, which I don't think it'll plot yet. No, it won't plot until the end of day six. Is that correct? Well, yeah, maybe it will. No. Okay, yeah, it's it's in here, but it won't plot, okay? No, you add, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, at the end of the day, we should get a moving average on this. But, yeah, absolutely. I To answer your question directly, yes. It is that it is if you have the IPO course, it's yeah, it's it's that setup. T U T W. Uh can't talk about that one's on the Landry list. Uh L N L L N W. I know we got a lot of unanswered questions, but I just pontificated way too much. And it's funny, coming in today, I'm like, I'm just gonna cover stocks today. We're not gonna I'm not gonna spend a lot of time lecturing. Um, yeah, maybe on the next pullback. Put that on your watch list for sure, but uh, it's it's breaking out. It's not pulling back. Okay, let's get a couple people that haven't uh, we can hand out to you. DUI for Sam. And then we're going to have to wrap things up soon. Yeah, put it on your watch list, but, you know, it's only had this one big update. It has one big – it's trading in gaps. And it's it's hard to trade a stock that trades in gaps, okay, and this big gap down. So – I would leave it alone. I mean, there's been some great stocks that go higher on these big, huge gaps, but it's just wide and loose, and it's hard to trade. There's no structure to this stock, and, and I'm trying to think of a better example than Kemet, but take a look at Kemet for lack of a better example. Notice it makes a base. It goes up. It bases, sets up, you know, takes off, accelerates higher, makes a base, takes off, hopefully make a base, rinse, and repeat, you know, so you want something that um, John, I'm long that stock, so it'd be easier for me just not to talk about it. But yeah, high five, best stock I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> um, I don't want to have to explain myself. Five and yeah, bring it out to new highs. That looks pretty good. Uh, it was kind of wide and loose, but mostly a big base in here. So yeah, put that on your watch list on pullbacks. It might be worth a shot. Yeah, see, that uh, stocks like DUI are gapping based on earnings and do not trend much at all. It kind of reminds me of Intuitive Surgical. As Intuitive got bigger, if I can make it come up, ISRG, as Intuitive became a big fixed stop, ISRG, just take my word for it, it, it started like just trading on these earning gaps, okay? It's just hard to trade. Uh, you know, gaps up, it goes down. Gaps down, it goes up, gaps down. It's a Jackie Mason stock, you know, and then in more recent times, it looks a lot better than it used to. But, yeah, these stocks like, and you pointed out DY, uh, just hard to trade because, especially in more recent times, they're all over the place. Okay, PSDO for Joe. PSDO. Yeah, um, in this particular case, I would let it make new highs. And then I would I would be in secondary setup mode here. Um, pioneer setup means you're looking to get in early in the IPO process or the first little rally. Uh, secondary setup would mean that you're waiting for a trend that a trend to follow. So let it break out and then play the first uh, pullback. You're welcome, Sam. Soda. Soda. Yeah, this one caught my eye because it is kind of a trend knockout uh, type of situation. It looks okay. I mean, it's it's uh, it's almost an extreme situation based on the volatility of the stock. I think that if it takes out this high, it would be okay. So I can kind of pick it apart, but I hear where you're coming from. And as a general statement, I think you can do a lot worse because, look, you got this kind of a gradual uptrend and then an accelerated higher. you got the mother ball trend knockouts. So if it takes out this high, then yeah, absolutely on that one. But it, it's like it's it pulled back to its prior base, so that's part of the that's one reason I didn't put it on the trading service because of that. Okay. XCNT, XCNT. Yeah, that looks good. Did we talk about this one already? 
I like almost a tiny bit more knockout, but I hear you. You could almost go with it as it is. Um, it's not too, too thin. Let's see what's going on longer term. Yeah, it's got some, some bad memories, but way back here. Yeah, it looks pretty good. I mean, that's just short of a high five, okay? If it were down just a tiny bit more, a little bit more knockout on here, I'd say high five, but you're close on that one. You're in the hunt for sure. Well, look, I know we've got a lot unanswered, but uh, I'm sorry about running long today. I'm going to have, go ahead and have to wrap things up to keep the recording within reason. But as you can tell, I have fun doing these. I enjoy doing these. It's the highlight of my week. So I want to appreciate. I want to thank you, and I'm appreciative of everyone for showing up. Uh, any unanswered questions, Dave at DaveLander.com. I probably won't be able to get to individual stock questions based on my workload lately. But uh, bring them next week. Uh, if they're just trending now and, and not directly set up, then maybe you'll have a week on those anyway. But uh, anyway, I appreciate everybody being here. Any, any, bleh, any unanswered questions, again, Dave at DaveLander.com. Everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk again. And then uh, hopefully we'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.